typically start my creative morning still around 10. So I had to bring notes because I don't want to miss uh, anything that I wanted to say. So welcome, first of all. Um, I thought it could be interesting based on this month's topic of freedom, which is clearly something that's important to, to oppress, um, to talk a little bit about the rich Detroit printing history. So I made just a, a few factoids that I thought were kind of interesting. Um, and, and in a city too, the, where clearly we're moving forward with a lot of uh, a future of, of creative endeavors and expression. So I think it all sort of ties together. Um, first and foremost, the impact of the printing press was clearly one of the, the, the most monumental events in, in human history. Um, it completely changed how people uh, conceived of and were able to communicate and the speed with which they were able to communicate sort of you know, their place in the world. Um, and I think it's still, it still felt today. So the um, concept of movable type was actually developed in China in the year approximately 1045 by a printer named uh, Bi Sheng. And um, most people know, of course, that Johannes Gutenberg uh, developed the printing press in the mid-15th century. So this was uh, letterpress printing. And it actually was the, uh, the norm, the, the way to print all the way through the 19th century and still widely used into the 20th century until the development of offset printing, um, which really took over for books and newspapers. Uh, now I need my notes. That part I remembered. Um, in Detroit, so here are the kind of cool factoids about Detroit. So Father Gabriel Richard, whom I'm sure most people have heard of, brought the first printing press, a letter press, to Detroit in 1809 from Baltimore. And he printed here the first newspaper west of the Allegheny Mountains. That was very interesting. Um, the very first labor union here in Detroit was started by printers. Um, this was in the 1830s. It was actually sort of a craft association. Um, in 1853, it became the Detroit Typographical Union, number 18, and it still functions today. Uh, the Detroit Free Press was the first sort of major newspaper in Detroit. That was in the 1830s that that was founded. Uh, the news came about 40 years after that. Uh, and various uh, printer-run, family-owned manufacturing printing companies were around the city um, starting in the 1850s. I found some really cool sort of old uh, advertising, advertising um, from 1855. And really through the 1950s, these companies sort of existed here in the city. I know there's still a few. Pika Joe, who operates a, a shop sort of on the east side, I believe, correct? So for the most part, though, they, they left the city in the 1950s. Um, so today, I'm, I, there's obviously so much going on in Detroit, so much reimagining, rebirth of really everything, from service uh, to manufacturing to all the, the creative endeavors that are underway. Um, made in Michigan, made in Detroit. I know that means a lot to people when they buy books, clothing, dishes, you name it. Um, one of the things we clearly foster here is, is made in Michigan, made in Detroit, the handcrafted. So Detroit manufacturing um, art and craft together. So for me, one of the things I find very interesting is that the, uh, the vehicle that was uh, created in the mid 15th century to really speed up communication and reach is now sort of paradoxically, at least here, being used to sort of slow things down take things down a notch, go back to sort of the handmade and the handcrafted, considering uh, being deliberate, really appreciating the art, the texture of, of the work. So that is something that Lynn will be showing you over on the studio side of the shop. So it's a fascinating time here, I think, and obviously, obviously in Detroit. Um, and I'm seeing other people in here who have done printing. Yeah. Yes, hey, Melinda, class, Melissa. Yeah. So yeah, so now about a couple, <laughs> nice segue, uh, a couple, couple points of business. So you are in the, the retail side, the shop side of the operation. Lynn will be showing you the studio side. On this side, everything that you see, so um, along the top here, you will see um, uh, linoleum tiles that have been carved and used to make prints. So letterpress printing is relief printing. Um, on the other side, you will see lots of different types of type, um, wood and metal. So this is just some of the things that we use to make prints here. About half of what you see is made on the studio side. Everything that you see um, is shared, all the proceeds are shared 50-50 with the artists who create it. 
um, what should I say? This place started at the end of 2011. It was inspired actually by um, founder Toby Barlow's trip to Nashville, Tennessee, where he saw the Hatch Print Show and uh, thought that something like that should be started here in Detroit, and he came back and, and really made that happen. Um, something cool, if you have time tomorrow, um, May is actually lit in the mid month, and I, in all honesty, I, I just started working here in uh, January after a 20, whatever, two year career in publishing, book publishing. Um, so you see some books here, but May is lit in the mid month, so there's a bunch of different activities, um, free and open to the public or very low cost for the most part. Um, throughout the month of May in the city, and we kick it off tomorrow night at 5 o'clock. We're celebrating uh, the launch of this book here, Canvas Detroit. Free and open to the public, come hang out, meet the authors, have some good snacks and some wine. Um, workshops, as Melinda mentioned. Um, right over there, kind of, yes, at the counter, there are workshop flyers. Thank you for holding those up. <laughs> Please feel free to take one. We encourage you to come and, and work with us. There's workshops, everything from sort of making your own business cards to greeting cards to learning to, to carve these tiles, these blocks, and, and print. Um, once you take two workshops with us, you are eligible for Open Studio, which means you can be over here um, very reasonably per hour working with, uh, troubleshooting with our printers to make your own projects. So it's a lot of fun, and once you get started, it's, it's hard to stay away from here. So thanks for coming in, and if you want to now go over to the, this side of the studio, Lynn is going to show you the really cool hands-on stuff. Our type collection here, uh, was the gathering began in 2011 when, the, when this idea for this place started. Some of it came from universities. Uh, we have a big, beautiful Vanderkoop proof press in the corner that came from Alma College. Unfortunately, a lot of print departments and colleges are um, dumping this stuff, thinking that digital is the only way to go, and we're, we're here to catch everything. So if, you, um, if you're interested in this, or if you come from a printing background and you have a grandma or a grandpa that printed and still has stuff in their basement, we're interested. You might be interested, but um, don't, don't throw it away. It should be used. Um, what happened, I think, last year is that um, there was an article that Michael Hodges wrote in the Detroit News about the resurgence of letterpress in Detroit. And someone read that and called us up and said that her father had a print shop in uh, Ohio. And they did get rid of the presses, but um, they couldn't bear to get rid of the type. And we have this, because of their generosity, a marvelous yeah. collection of wood type that I think would really be hard to put together now. It's so expensive to, I mean, you see it on eBay, like one letter is $6. And we have two full cabinets of this beautiful wood type. So that's not here for beginners, but for people who know what to do, you have this full um, play of, um, of the wood type as well. Um, just because you all work so much with, well, I think many of you are working with type and design, just wanted to talk a little bit about terminology and some of the things that you work with every day on the computer but may not realize the connection they have um, to type. So when you talk about um, you want more letting in between your letters and your lines, it actually comes from the real letting that you use to set type. Um, I wanted to give a of you, uh, let's see. If I give a few of you this letter, see if you can uh, tell me what it is. Probably not, and then it'll like teach you. <laughs> so it could be a B or a D, right? Or it could be a P or a Q. So that old uh, adage, mind your P's and Q's, yes. comes from looking at type and you know trying to guess what type is. So this is the California job case. This is basically the layout of a case of type. So uh, this is really what you would use almost like your keyboard. This is what you would use to figure out what your type is. Where did they go? Oh, you want to pass them And so this is a tray, a, a case of type that you would use to set whatever you were working on, a broadside, uh, a page of a book. And if you can look here, I don't want this to tip, but this is called a form. So this is um, all the type that's set using a variety of type faces. Um, by the way, the word font that everybody uses interchangeably used to mean something different. Now we use it and uh, you know, you're using a Spartan book and that's the font you use. It used to mean a prescribed amount of type that you would order for your type drawer. So a font would be 23 E's because 
I'm not saying the number is wrong, but you know, you'd have more E's because you use E's a lot. And that would be the amount of metal type that you would then put into your type drawer. So that's, that's really good. I don't know how it came to be uh, that people gave up typeface in each spot, but that's another one. Um, <coughs> type used to be stored in different places. So the things that we know now as lowercase used to be in the lower cases. And uppercase used to be in the cases up high. On the press, you'll see that there's something called a deadline, which we know and we ignore. But um, deadline used to mean you would put all the type on the press and you try to fit as much as you could from a newspaper all up to the deadline so that you could print it and take a proof of it. So it had a practical meaning as well. So anyway, here's this very complicated setup, and then this is what the resultant print. So you can see that um, it's, uh, I liken it to a kind of a construction project. You use small pieces, and then you get larger and larger, and then you're doing some kind of design. But the basic tools of your construction project are um, the pieces of lead, and then the type that's in your case, which I'm going to set maybe slowly, maybe quickly, just to give you an idea. So everything's set up in uh, Picus, which you still work with unless you switch to inches on your computer. And each piece is set one piece at a time, which, what's that piece of in? This is a spacer, so this is lower than type. So instead of hitting space on your, you know, on, if you would hit the spacer bar, there's actually a physical piece of type uh, that's lower than the characters. Do you have for the... This is a composing stick. Yeah, and this is your pica ruler. And this little guy is called the knee. So this is 20 picas long. So I lock the knee up to 20 picas and then one by one fill up that line. I'm trying to do creative more while I'm talking. So do you see how slow this is? Partly because I have a 30 people watching me, but part of it, it's really slow. So imagine that beautiful Gutenberg Bible that you may have seen. Has anybody seen pictures of that? It's, it's, a, stunning, uh, it's a stunning work of, uh, it's a work of art, and it's a work of typographic genius. Um, there are a few of them that were actually printed on vellum, on real, um, that is real animal skin, but the thing that changed uh, civilization as much as handset type is the invention of paper. Because people were doing writing on manuscripts, writing manuscripts by hand on animal skin. So the preparation for that was really pretty laborious. And the invention of paper uh, was a lot cheaper, even though that was, um... <laughs> anyway, so the invention of paper and the invention of type really transformed things. And what Jane said is interesting, that we found so many people that are really interested now in uh, doing this, working with their hands, seeing actually like the physical um, texture, you can pass this around, the actual imprint into the paper. So here's Creative Morning. And you can see that the type has these little cutouts here. These are called a nix. So that sort of helps you figure out if you're doing it in the wrong or the right direction. So I brought up just a few bits of um, show and tell. <clears throat> this is a piece that um, I did that actually said it um, with individual letters in Hebrew and in English type. And it sort of relates back to Gutenberg. It um, was a noted scholar of the time trying to convince people that it was OK. The printing press was a really good invention. That um, uh, even though most of the holy books were written by hand, it would, it would be okay to embrace the printing press, and it was a wonder of the world, because people were pretty suspicious of it. Um, these are a few pieces that um, uh, my colleagues that work here are creating. This is, a, this is really a mixed media. This is partly carbon linoleum, partly a plastic plate, <laughs> like, which I'll show you, and then hand-set wood type. Um, somebody, uh, a woman who has a store on Mackinac Island contacted us and has commissioned us to do some original work for her store, and I guess if the ice ever brings up, we'll be able to deliver it. Um, this is one that um, Megan who works here, is working on with um, part of our collection of wood type. 
Uh, this is another uh, piece I did. We were lucky enough to have the um, poet John Yao come and read here, and so I did a broadside. Um, broadsides used to be um, political leaflets that were hand set in type and then you know handed out on street corners to spread the word. It's now come to mean um, usually working with a, with um, a poem and a word and image on one single page. So this is actually done with, it's hard to see, you can look at it um, closely, but there's some wood type that I set here, but also plastic printing plates, which is a really interesting <coughs> combination of new and old technology. So you can design in um, InDesign, you can design in Illustrator, and send a file away. So this is the design work, this is the plastic printing plate, and you put it on a base, and it brings it up to the same height as type, so it's the same height as wood or metal. Anything that sticks up, it will take ink that's in relief, will get printed. So, <coughs> excuse me. So this, uh, I was able to work with all the text and move it around in the computer so I could see what it was, and then have a plastic printing plate made. Do you have a uh, middle type that's small? No, this is my, we do actually. Yeah, we do have one. Yeah. Yes. Yes, this is wood type. The poem is called the um, poem of the anonymous. So the word anonymous is here from wood type. And then these were actually pieces of wood that I printed in a like basically transparent ink just to suggest the spine of the book. So the idea was to set something up on the press for you so that you could see a press in action, and then everybody is welcome, depending on your time, to print one and take it away. We have enough paper for everybody to have that.